the death rate went down to 4%. Now the Bible also says a woman who gives birth is unclean. And even when she has your period, she's unclean. Again, you know, typical anti-women rhetoric in the Bible. Well, actually, think about it. How susceptible to an infection is a woman when they give birth? Think about that. So Semmelweis says, if you touch a woman, you're unclean. You have to wash your hands with soap and water between every patient. The death rate went down to half a percent. You'd think they would have proclaimed him a hero, but instead they, they rebelled, they refired him, and six months later he died of a blood infection. Now, interesting, the prescription was this, ashes from the heifer sacrifice, water, and thymol. I'm sorry, and hyssop. Now, hyssop is in the thyme family, and hyssop is a very, very oily plant, and the oil and the ashes and the water make soap. And it just so happens that 10% of the mass of hyssop is thymol. And I, I teach organic chemistry. I just taught about phenols just a couple weeks ago. And when I talk about the phenols, the first property I mentioned is that phenols are antiseptic. In fact, they're the most powerful antiseptic, non-poison substances, class of substances we have. So in other words, the prescription, if you touch a dead body, was to wash yourself all over with a powerful antibacterial soap. I see some scientific wisdom there. I, again, I'm skipping a number of examples. I'm just going to look at one more because I want to go on to the next topic. Uh, in Genesis 17, 12. Circumcision. Circumcision. Why circumcision? And circumcision on the eighth day. Why circumcision on the eighth day? Well, think about it. Again, yeast and bacteria was the main cause of death. Where do uh, yeast and bacteria want to grow? Warm, dark, wet places. And where's the warmest, darkest, wettest place on a guy? All right. Well, it depends on whether you've had it cut off or not. It, it kind of depends. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the foreskin. All right, yeah. So, again, how many lives were saved? Now, today, guys, I assume you take a shower. All right, it's not a major problem. But, again, thousands of lives were saved by that simple little thing. Why the eighth day, though? You know, if... If the Jews had said the third day, that would make sense. The three, the number three, it's kind of a, you know, in the mysticism of Near Eastern religion, number three, seven, that would have made sense. This seven had spiritual significance. I don't know of any spiritual significance in number eight in Judaism. Why the eighth day? Well, again, I don't know. Just like God didn't explain to the Jews why when you touch a dead body you're unclean, he could have said, well, because of the germs, they would have, germs, what's a germ? That wouldn't have been helpful. He didn't explain this either, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe God had another reason, or I don't know. But it just so happens, when children are born, if you cut them, there's a, they probably bleed to death because they don't have vitamin K. The vitamin K does not pass from mother to child through the placenta. It just doesn't. And of course, in order for blood clotting to happen, you need not just vitamin K, but also the protein prothrombin. Children have low levels of prothrombin, but not zero. But then what happens when they're born, the prothrombin pro drops virtually to zero because there's no vitamin K. Now, we don't produce vitamin K. It's produced mainly by bacteria in our intestine. Baby eats from mom, baby gets bacteria. Three, four days later, baby starts having significant levels of vitamin K. The prothrombin level starts rising to safe levels. In fact, it goes to extra high levels, and then it drops back down to the normal level. So I'm going to show you a graph of, this is scientific data, of prothrombin level versus time for children. And I didn't make this up, okay? And guess what the safest day to, to circumcise a male child is from the day they're born to the day they die? By the way, the ninth day is, you know, the ninth day would be just as good. Seventh day would be fine. Probably the tenth day would be okay. But again, how, how did Abraham know this? I mean, where did Abraham get this knowledge. Now, this, this slide is a joke. I, that, that's a joke. You're not, you know, he's, you know he did a, you know, <laughs> double-blinded, um, I don't think that's what it was. So people say the Bible is scientifically unsupported and probably unsupportable. I say, you know, where are these science errors? I'm going to talk, by the way, I'm going to talk a little bit about Genesis and all that further down our talk. But, you know, where are these errors? I see scientific wisdom. In Hebrews 11.3, it says, By faith we know that what is seen is made out of 
What is unseen? And science has discovered that there was nothing and then everything came into existence. So I say, really? All right, proposition number two by Dallas McCown, the Christianity is philosophically suspect at best. Now, I suppose what is the best philosophy is probably an opinion. We could debate what's the best philosophy. But people laugh at Christian philosophy. It's called theology. And, you know, why? I, I say, why? Uh, the, the two main, I guess, if you will, philosophies at the, at the scholastic institutions today are, are, are materialism, naturalism, and postmodernism. And I'm not here to say postmodernism is stupid or anything like that. In fact, there's things about postmodernism I actually like. But um, people say about well, Christian philosophy, I mean, you know, silly. I mean, you know, what, what kind of philosopher could accept that? I, I want to challenge that notion. I want us to think a little bit about naturalism and if, how, how good a philosophy that is. And I want to think a little bit about uh, um, scientific um, postmodernism. By the way, I'm not going to talk about Socrates. He's just a guy you've heard of who's a philosopher. So there you go. All right, Christian philosophy. I believe that Christian philosophy gives a more realistic description of things as they really are than either materialism or postmodernism. I don't think either postmodernism or materialism can explain the universe that we live in nearly as well as Christian theology, Christian philosophy. Materialism denies the existence of truth, of morality and value. That's a superior philosophy? I, I want to question that. Postmodernism says there's nothing true, or all true is equally, all truth is equally true. And, you know, it's true for you, it's true for me. I don't know, I don't find that a particularly satisfactory philosophy. So I want to talk about naturalism, sometimes called materialism. It's the belief that the only reliable or valid instrument for deciding what's truth is what can be measured through scientific observation. In other words, if science cannot detect it, it doesn't exist. Right? Now, I don't have a problem with science. In fact, I'm a scientist. I, I kind of like science. I think it's cool stuff. But science as a philosophy, to me, stinks. It's, it's just not good philosophy. It's a good way to discover knowledge about the physical world. So, uh, if, if naturalism is true, then there's, there's no ethics, no absolute ethics, no, no morality. Morality is just a, a, a social construct. There's no supernatural, no God, no truth. Or put it this way, no truth beyond physical things. The only true things are physical. And if, if that's true, then I don't exist. If the naturalist is right, then I don't exist. I mean, when I say I, uh, think about it. Ask this question. Are you a body or do you have a body? If, if I had to ask you a question... Are you a body, or do you have a body? Which would you go with? I think you'd say, I have a body. All right? But if you are a body, then who are you then? You're just chemicals and neurons firing, and, and you, your consciousness is just an epiphenomena, and, and you know, I, I what's, what's I? You say, I love you. What you mean is, my chemicals right now are being released in a way and, and causing the nerves to go to make me say that. Not that I actually do. <laughs> That's naturalism. That's better philosophy than Christian philosophy? Help me out here. And the atheist would say, well, it's true. Buck up. All right, but I don't think it is true. Even if it is, it's very depressing. And if naturalism is true, then justice is a, is a figment of our imagination. Justice, is, that's a meaningless word. Here's how Richard Dawkins states it. In the universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky. You won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind Pitiless indifference. And, and Christian philosophy is suspect at best. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. There's the meaning in life. Now, science is good at some things. It's, science is really good at certain things. Asking when, where, what, how many. 